Welcome to Choice Classic Radio, where we bring to you the greatest old-time radio shows. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and thank you for donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For your listening enjoyment, John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Ned Talbot, Johnny. What are you working on? Why, nothing at the moment. I was thinking of going to New York for a couple of days. Why? Well, I have one here on my desk you might be able to do something with while you're there. Well, tell me about it. Corinthian covers a textile outfit in New York. Wallace Cotton and Company. This week their audit has found a shortage in the books. How much is the shortage? Well, it's nearly 5000 uh, Wait, I got it right here. Uh, $4,185. And I'm supposed to find out who took it? Oh, no, we already know who did that. One of the bookkeepers in their office, uh, Lester James. He's been arrested and admitted everything. I thought maybe you could find out what he did with all that money. Well, I'm going to New York anyway. I'll see what I can do. Expense accounts submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lester James matter. Expense account item one, $32.56. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. After receiving from Ned Talbot the necessary information concerning the indemnity claim of Wallace Cotton and Company Incorporated. I arrived in New York at 1.30 in the afternoon and checked in at the New Western. Central Division told me that Lester James was being held in the 17th Precinct Jail. I went right over. Come on, here you are, darling. Now what? Uh, take it easy, James. This is Johnny Dollar. He wants to talk to you. Hello, James. Hi. Uh, I'll see you later, Dollar, huh? Yeah, thanks, Dollar. You'll give me a yell when you finish, huh? Right. Well, what are you? Lawyer or something? No. I don't want a lawyer. Said somebody be around to talk to me again, but I don't want to see anybody. Why not? I just don't want to see anybody, that's all. Well, you'll have to be represented by counsel when you go to court. All right, let somebody represent me. Just a technicality, anyhow. I know what'll happen in court. I've got my confession. Who are you, anyway? I'm an insurance investigator. Well, what are you doing here? It's a swell day outside. I'm trying to find out what you did with that 4185 bucks that you took from Wallace Cotton. All right. Yeah, that. How about it, James? Isn't it enough that I'm in jail? It's enough for the police, but not for my insurance company. I don't have anything to say to you. Now, well, look, don't be foolish. A whole or a partial recovery will have a lot to do with what happens to you in court. I don't want to be foolish. It's just that I spent it all. Every dime of it. No way to pay it back. Spend it on what? Doesn't make any difference. Might make a lot of difference. I don't have anything to tell you. You've never been in trouble before, have you? No. They think of things like that when a man comes up for sentencing. Now, this is your first offense. I know, I know. You trying to shield somebody, James? Why don't you go away? You've been trying the market? Did you gamble with it? No, no, just leave me alone. I won't tell you anything, Mr. Dollar. If you bought something with it or... Gave it to somebody. If it can be recovered. No, 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 I tell you. Go away. Leave me alone. I'd like to. But you're a thief, James. And you're going to get what's coming to you. I can't leave you alone. Listen. Now, you listen to me. If I don't get the information I want from you, I'll get it elsewhere. I'm going to be real honest with you. Corinthian Liability wrote a blanket policy on Walls, Cotton, and Company. Promising to pay them in full for every loss caused by fire or theft on their premises. Now, no insurance company takes the word of some guy sitting in a jail cell where there's cash to be recovered. It's the same as stolen property. If you gave it to someone or spent it when it wasn't yours, it's still redeemable. Now, what do you have to say? Look, Mr. Dollar, this won't do you any good. I'm no low forehead job who got caught crawling in a drugstore window. I'm a college graduate. I've been in the business world for ten years or better. I know what I want to tell you and what I want to keep to myself. And I don't want to talk about this, do you understand? And there's no way or no person who can make me talk about it. I took the money, I admitted that. 
I did a bad job of it. I was caught. I confessed, and you've got me. And that's the whole story. Okay. Have it your way, Les. Go away. Just go away, please. Lester James was a tall, dark-complexioned man in his early 30s. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features regular. Not good, not bad. The kind of man you see every day on the street. Somehow, the kind of man I hadn't expected to meet. Expense account item two. Dollar thirty-five. Cab fare. I went over to the apartment on 59th Street where Lester James had lived. According to the pencil note above the first door to the right of the entrance, Mrs. Anastasia Denovich was the manager. Yes, what is it, please? Uh, you're uh, Mrs. Denovich? Yes, what do you want, mister? I understand that Mr. Lester James lives here. Is that right? Oh, yes. Bad. Bad. I hear it's still money. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Uh, I'm from the insurance company, Mrs. Denovich. We're trying to recover some of that money if we can. Wonder if you could help him. I think still enough for my son. He's come home from work. What I do? Well, I want to know about Lester James. What is it? The work, Mrs. Denovich. Did he drink? Gamble? Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? You're a policeman? Insurance investigator. Oh, please. Sometime else. Look, it's important now. I talked to Lester on phone. He said I have to answer any questions. Well, you don't have to, but I'd appreciate it if you would. My son home soon. Uh, uh, all right, mister. I know these things. You ask about men who live here. Well, look, how about his friend? Who visited him? I no. I cannot say. No visitor. Oh, is he a good tenant? No trouble. Like Mr. O'Sullivan on third floor, always drunk. Fine. Did you ever meet his girl? Girl? Well, sure, his girl. He oh. has a girlfriend. No, I, I never see girlfriend. Uh, how long have you known him? Five, six years, maybe, ever since he moved in here, this place. Do you know how he spent his time? Work. He wore a card. No, I mean besides working at the textile company. How else? I no. He poor fella, that one. How's that? He still money through, but he poor fella the same. For him, I feel. Yeah. Lester, he quiet and he thinks. I know he live up in that little room quiet. Thinks he does all the time, he thinks. Oh, my son, Skinner, please, you go now. Uh, just a minute. I'd like to see his apartment if I can. Mm. No, Martha. You bring key back, please. Mm, thank you, Mrs. Benavides. The apartment Lester James had lived in was as dismal as the neighborhood. A tiny closet kitchen, a bed that came out of the wall, and a pair of grimy windows that looked across the court into another pair of equally grimy windows. The furniture was early 30s and threadbare. Among his personal effects, I found nothing of value. The apartment yielded no more information than James had. Expense account item three, $1.95, dinner. I had it in a neighborhood restaurant called the 59er, a place where, I learned, Lester James had frequently eaten. The restaurant manager remembered him and liked him. A woman who ran a bakery shop across the street told me how he'd come back from the war in 1946 and had worn his uniform for a month until he got a job and could buy some civilian clothes. All in all, I was getting a composite picture of Lester James that didn't look quite right. Whatever he was to the people who knew him casually, he wasn't a man who ever had any money to spend. Well, I had... Hi. No good, huh? Mm -hmm. Now that's where it goes. <clears throat> we had some action here today, no? Oh? Sit down. <laughs> Jim's preliminary hearing was this afternoon. The man from the district attorney's office took about 15 minutes to lay out the evidence against James. Uh -huh. And the public defender took about three minutes trying to get James to answer one question. What did he do with the money? Did I miss anything? Yeah, not a thing. Wouldn't open up at all. Just said that he'd spent it. Well, the public defender about threw up his hands. I'm about ready to throw up mine. When is the trial set for? Uh, sometime next week. I'd like to talk to him again. He didn't move yet? Didn't go to the sheriff's office. Somebody bail him? He bailed himself. $200 he had in war bonds. He left you? No. Uh -uh. Go get out at about six. That's when the ship changes. Are you still want to see him? 
Yeah, I'll wait. An hour later, when Lester James emerged from the doorway and turned right, I followed him about a half a block behind. When he caught a cab and headed uptown, I caught one, stayed right with him. When he got out of the Empress Theater and walked around to the stage door, I was standing at the alley entrance. Ten minutes later, he came out and hailed a cab. Once more, I followed. This time, he went back to his apartment on 59th Street. I waited 15 minutes before I went in. James? James? James, it's me. Johnny Dollar. I got a couple of whiffs of it standing there in front of the door. <coughs> the room was acrid, stinging with gas fumes. And Lester James was stretched out on the floor of his six-foot kitchen. <coughs> when I picked him up and carried him out, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. Second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Thirty seconds after I found Lester James, I'd call the police ambulance, and in a matter of minutes, an intern was working over him with a pull motor. There was no telling how much gas he breathed in or for how long a time the jet had been open. Hand me that. Thanks. Swab. Okay. You alive? Maybe. Hard to say on these. That shot should cause some reaction. Oh. Is this your place? Oh, it's his. You know him? His name is Lester James. I met him earlier today. Can you give me that? Uh, we might be getting something here. About this thing? Yeah. He'll be sick if... Oh. What? He's catching on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's have a little more. Getting some pulse. Perspiration, too. What are you making? Well, it depends. If he had a heart condition, it would be tough. There's nothing more we can do here. Let's move him. Now, where will he be? 48th Street Emergency. Why? Well, I'd like to talk to him when he comes around. Better phone in first. I'm sure. Third one tonight. What is it? The weather? Not for him. You know why? He's out on bail. There was a trial on an embezzling charge pretty soon. Oh. Well, I'll be sure and call him. Yeah, right. The investigating officers questioned me regarding the circumstances of Lester James' attempted suicide. I told them what had happened and gave them my business address for reference. After that, I went back to my hotel and had dinner. Then I went over to the Empress Theater. A musical show was playing there. And it had just finished. Hey, isn't I get that, mister? A dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar. What can I do for you, sir? Between 6.30 and 7 o'clock tonight, a man came here to the stage entrance and talked to you. <laughs> a lot of people talk to me here. What man? His name was Lester James. Uh, no, I don't remember no Lester James. Maybe he didn't give you his name. Uh, you come here to see somebody? Is that better? He might have. I don't know. He's about 5'11". Weighs 175 or 80. Didn't have any hat on. Raincoat. Dark man. You remember him? Oh, oh yes, of course. Him, yes. You remember him? Oh, sure. Yeah, he's been around a lot of times. Lester Jones. Yeah, I didn't even recognize that name first. It... Would you mind telling me what he was doing here? Well, he comes here to see Margie Cook. That his girlfriend? Oh, no, I don't think so. She never sees him when he asks. Who's Margie Cook? Uh, she sings here. You ever seen them together? Well, don't know. I've never seen them together. Is she still here? Uh, what's that? I'd like to talk to her. Is she still here? Oh, no, no, Margie left. She finishes in the second act. Could you tell me where she lives? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I can't tell you that. <laughs> well, where can I phone her? Well, I just can't tell you that either. Look, will you do me a favor? Well, if I can, what is it? Would you telephone her and... 
tell her my business and ask her if you'd see me? Well, I suppose I can do that, all right, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Take care of that, there. I'll just see what I can do. Expense account item four. Two dollars and sixty-five cents. More cab fare. This time to the apartment of Margie Cook, singer. She met me at the door with cold cream on her face, wrapped in a chenille dressing gown. Now, Miss Cook? You must see Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. I didn't quite understand Frank on the telephone. Frank? Oh, the, the doorman at the theater. Yeah. Yes. I didn't quite know what to make of. Couldn't be you really an insurance detective? Yeah, investigator. Can I fix your drink? No, no, thanks. You mentioned something about a man named Lester James, Mr. Dollar? Yes. You know him? Well, no, I don't. There's uh, sort of a reservation in the way you say that, Miss Cook. You know his name? Yes, I know the name. What's this all about? Oh, just a routine investigation. Are you sure? Oh, yes. I'm curious. How did you get my name? How am I connected with Lester James? Well, that's what I want you to tell me. Oh, first, about my name. Well, James is at the theater tonight asking for you. I found that out from the doorman. And then... I asked to speak to you. Oh. I understand James has been around there quite a bit. No. I, <laughs> I really don't know how to tell you this. I've only seen the man once in my life. Is that so? Oh, yes. He's... He's really quite impossible. I... <laughs> Dear. This is very embarrassing to be asked about a thing like this by a complete stranger. Well, maybe I can save you that embarrassment if you'll answer one question. All right. Can you ever give you any presents? Yes. What? Well, that cigarette case there. This one? Mm Mm-hmm. And the lighter to go with it. Uh Uh-huh. Tiffany's. Pretty, aren't they? And expensive. What else? Well, let me think. Oh, that wasn't from him. Oh, that was. What? The lamp over there. Uh Uh-huh. And the fur piece. Uh, Could I see that? I'm afraid I gave it away. Oh. I gave it to my kid sister who was visiting me a couple of months ago. What kind of fur piece was it? Ermine. Ermine. I think that's about it. Except for orchids that used to come every night. A dozen orchids every night. He sent them to you? Mm-hmm. For about three months. You only saw him once and he gave you all these gifts. Oh, dear. I, I know how that must sound. Look, it started about six months ago, I guess. I got a card in my dressing room one night asking me to dinner. It was signed Lester James. Well, I'd never heard of anyone named Lester James, and I tore it up. But every night after that, I kept getting the card, and pretty soon flowers, and then the lighter, and the cigarette case came. That's when I saw him. I didn't even dine with him, Mr. Dollar. We had one drink, and I told him I had a headache. I see. Gifts still kept coming, flowers, invitations, and I ignored them. I tried to send the things back, but I didn't know where to send them, so I gave away some, and some I've kept, and that's it. Why didn't you see him after that one night? Oh, he was so different than what I'd imagined. I mean, I've had my share of stage door Johnny's, but this man was... Well, he couldn't say a word without stumbling. He had no poise, no sophistication, nothing. All he had was money. I see. Well, he didn't have money either, Miss Cook. What? He worked for $72 a week as a bookkeeper. But all the gifts, the things he gave me, sent me, he had to have money. He's been stealing it to buy those things for you. Why, for heaven's sake. That's why you're here. No wonder. He tried to commit suicide a couple of hours ago. Suicide? No. Oh, no. I'm sorry I had to come to you to get this information. He wouldn't tell anybody what he'd done with the money. Will he go to prison? I'm afraid so. But we had nothing. He was just a name to me. Well, apparently, you were something more to him. I spent the next two days tracking down the places from which the gifts had been purchased and ascertaining their retail values. Totaled $2,780. I also learned from Margie Cook that Lester James had made appointments to meet her at various times at different expensive restaurants around town. She had never once kept any of these appointments. A check with the Waldorf, 21, the Stork, and several other places revealed that James had always made elaborate arrangements to entertain her. 
His restaurant bills, which were paid, came to $835. The florist bill, $680. Total, $4,295. Hello? Hi. Remember me? Sure. Sure, it's fine. What now? How do you feel? Okay. You saved me, didn't you? I suppose so. Why? Well, for the same reason you'd save a man who was dying, James. <laughs> you know what I've been doing? What? Answering the questions that you wouldn't answer. I met Margie Cook. What? My job, I had to. Listen, you had no right to go to her. You had no right. No. It's the company's money you were spending on her. I had every right. Unpleasant as it may be. <laughs> she... She knows all about me? Yep. We took back all the things you gave her. <laughs> you dirty scum. Look, look, don't get mad at me. Get mad at yourself. I didn't steal the money, you did. Why didn't you leave it alone? What difference does the money make to you? Nothing to me. What do you want now? Well, I didn't get all of it traced down. There's still $410 I'm worried about. I, uh... Yeah. Here. I've got this much. Yeah. Can you remember what you did with the rest of it? Pretty thorough, aren't you? I try to be. Well? Oh, come on, Lester. We've got most of it. What difference does it make now? You and your money. That's all it is to you. Dollars and cents. Dollars and cents that were stolen. Remember that. What did you do? See her on the stage one night? No. She was in the office. Office? Your office? Yes. Some fashion convention about six months ago. She was modeling some of our fabrics for them. The publicity people brought her over. I never saw anyone like that before. You figured a little money would attract her to you, huh? I heard that's the best way to do it. Well, it's one way, but it's not the best way, Leslie. That's I pictured myself knocking on a door one night and saying, I'm a bookkeeper and I live on 59th Street. Why don't you come over and have a bottle of beer with me? You know, she might have come. What makes you think so? I met her. Up until the time I talked with Lester James in the emergency hospital, I had my doubts about love at first sight. But after I talked to him, I was convinced that it could and did happen to him. I was sorry that he didn't know quite how to handle it. I was also wondering if I'd been in his shoes, would I have done the same thing? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I was afraid you might have left town. Well, I'm just packing up. Who's this? Mikey Cook. Remember me? Oh, yeah, sure. I haven't been able to sleep thinking about, well, thinking about that man. Lester Jane? Yes. What'll happen to him? He'll go to prison. Even with all the money returned? Only half of that stuff's redeemable. Take at least, oh, 2,500 more. And then what? Well, then it would be up to the court. I want to pay it. What? I want to make it up. The whole thing. Look, Miss Cook, uh, I know your motives are the best, but uh, you're not responsible in any way for this man's action. He just went... Dollars. He's the first man I've ever known who actually went out on a limb for the girl he loved. I'm the girl, and he's the man. Are you serious? Poor Dumbbell. He doesn't belong in any prison. You ought to get married to some nice girl. I want to help. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> Expense account item five, twenty eight dollars, hotel. Item six, thirty seven dollars, meals. Item seven, fifteen dollars, fifteen cents, miscellaneous. Item eight, same as one. Transportation back home. Total one hundred and fifty one dollars and twenty two cents. Remarks James comes to trial next week in view of Margie Cook's paying back the money he stole. James just might get a suspended sentence. But as always, that's up to the court. Here's truly Johnny Dollar.